Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Welcome back. Uh, we've been uh, talking in our series here with Jeff Newkirk, who's the CEO of PEM Consulting Group. Jeff, we've been talking about your rear approach to a um, improving the bottom line and rear is review mm-hmm. and examine and adjust and revise. So let's move now more into detail and specifics um, and how to really apply this to an organization that's looking to improve their bottom line. So when we think about business operations, what does that really mean? Mm-hmm. Well, we got to look at the business from several different uh, components. So when we look at the operations, we have to take into consideration not just uh, you know, systems or processes. Uh, certainly that's part of the operation, but we're going to look at it from the entire business. And what I mean by that is we have to look at the money side, the direct impact uh, on, the, on the financials. So we're looking at accounting looking at the financial management of that accounting. We're looking at marketing and sales. We're looking at resource management. Resource management includes both uh, the supplies and equipment used to produce or service, as well as the people. We're also looking at systems and processes associated with delivering the product or service. And then the technology, Uh, that's the hardware, software, all the protection of the technology and systems used within the business. So business operation, it's very comprehensive, many different components to it. Uh, the way I like to think of it is just you know, big picture stuff. You got the money, which is financial and accounting, the marketing and sales, uh, the resource management, operations, uh, which uh, talks to the processes and systems within the business and then the technology. And and like we've said before through this, this conversation, um, each one has an impact upon the other. So it's like having plates spinning on a stick. You can't just focus on one or two. You've got to get them all up there spinning and then tap them and tap them and tap them and keep them running because if one of them falters, it has a cascading effect on the other. So is that what you've seen in your experience with operations, business operations? It, absolutely. So when I talk about the, the money side and, and speak specifically to accounting and the financials, uh, every part of the business, almost every decision that's made has some type of financial implication. So I'm not just compartmentalizing accounting and finance and in that part of the business and nothing else impacts it. No, that's not the case at all. Every single part of the business, 99% of the decisions that are made have some type of a financial impact. They all work in sync. It's like putting a big, big puzzle together. So the big puzzle is the entire business and the different pieces are the different components, whether it's uh, making sure that all the accounting is done correctly, making sure that you have the correct promotions and pricing and marketing plans and the people, you got all the right people in the right positions, um, and then all the technology that you're going to need to to make sure that everything is running according to plan. Yeah, that's that's a super super good point. Now let's let's think about the actual financial statements. I know this is a, a broad uh, question, but I know a lot of people would think, mm-hmm. "How do you even read them? Where do you start?" Yeah, good question. So, and it can be uh, somewhat overwhelming, right? I mean, if you don't uh, look at financial statements on a regular basis, uh, then you kind of wonder, like, well, what do I? What statement do I look at? What's the most important? So I, I look at the, the three key statements within every, any business. Uh, there are a number of statements to look at, but these three, I think, are the most critical. Cash flow, income statement, or P&L, profit and loss, and balance sheet. So I see these three as the most critical because they tell you what your position is with regard to your financial performance, 
how you're able to pay your bills, whether you have uh, equity in your business, and how overall the operations are performing based on the plan that you've set up and the budget you've put together. So again, cash flow, income, balance sheet, those are the three statements that I think are the, really the most critical that you need to look at uh, regularly. And let's think about, um, you know, kind of like the cliff notes version of each one. Is there one or two spots or key points that you would recommend when looking at each one of those statements to see mm-hmm. the, the key indicators? Yes. So cash flow, you know, we go back to the old adage, cash is king, right? I mean, I'm not sure that I, I necessarily like the, the term, but cash tells you whether you're able to pay your your debt, your current bills, the bills that are coming in each month. So you need to see what is the cash increase and decrease over the course of a period. And that period could be uh, as short as a week or a month uh, or a fiscal period or a fiscal year. So you need to look at what is the operations doing to your cash balance. Income statement, there are different parts of the income statement. I think it's a Important to note here that net income is not necessarily the indicator of how the business is performing because there's all kinds of non-operating items that get thrown into the income statement. So, for example, you could have a negative operating margin. The negative operating margin tells you that your business, the operations of your business, is not performing uh, in a profitable banner. So your expenses associated with the operation are greater than the revenues you're taking in on the operation. But then you have all these non-operating line items. For example, if you sell assets that are non-operating related and you realize some revenue on those, your net income can actually be positive Mm -hmm. while your operating margin is negative. So you really need to look at the operating income within the income statement and gross margin gross margin tells you how much money or what is your profitability based on your net sales plus the cost of goods associated with those direct sales so if you look at gross margin that tells you how you're performing on the net sales operating income tells you how you're performing on the business operations and then the net income looks at everything operating and non-operating Okay. So Good. definitely need to look into detail of the income statement. Is Would you say that one financial statement is more important than another, or are they all equally important? Well, you know, it depends on how urgent the situation is within the business. So what I mean by that is if the business is performing according to plan, then I would say looking at the three, uh, obviously, no matter what how the business is performing, you're going to look at these three statements, cash flow, income, balance sheet. But if there is an urgent need within the business or they're not uh, performing according to plan and they're having difficulty meeting some of their expenses, then you look at cash flow. Because cash is going to tell you, are you, do you have enough liquidity? Do you have enough cash in the bank to pay those, for those bills that are coming in today? And that's so critical because if you don't, you've got to make some adjustments quickly uh, to get to that liquidity, liquid, liquid position so you can, you can pay your current debt. Otherwise, you're going to run into uh, bankruptcy kinds of issues, and you want to avoid that at all costs. Yes, and, and that would cause you then to need to dip into other resources, maybe like a line of credit, which would solve that short-term need, but then throw an, a liability into the mix. That's right. That's right. And, you know, taking on more debt is not necessarily uh, the direction to go. And, you know, there's there's all kinds of opportunities right now where small and medium sized businesses can take uh, take on additional debt. But remember, the debt is something that you have to pay back. Mm -hmm. It's not a gift. So you're taking on a loan and you don't necessarily have to pay it back today, but you're going to have to pay it back at some point. So you have to be mindful of the fact that taking on more debt 
means you're going to have to pay that back at some point, which means you're going to have to have enough cash in order to do that. And there, there is, I'm sure, a, a valid reason for taking on debt if it's good debt. So as an example, there might be um, a piece of equipment that if you needed to uh, borrow money for, that would then expand your production because you have so much demand. Well, now you know that that one move could bring in a large increase in, in your output and your revenues. So I think you would agree um, that there's a, a, a decision there with how to use that debt, what it would do oh. for the business. Absolutely. And you have to be mindful of what equipment you need to purchase to make sure that your operations are going according to plan. And that's why uh, you have not just an operating budget, but you have a capital budget. And that capital budget tells you all of the big ticket items, you know, the most expensive items that you're going to purchase during the course of a, a fiscal period. So the worst thing, and I've seen this happen many times, where a client doesn't adhere to the capital budget, but they have enough, um, they have a strong financial position where they can take on debt to get another piece of equipment that they just really, really wanted, but it's not in their capital budget, it's not in their plan, and what's going to happen? Short term, they're going to have that piece of equipment that they wanted, but long term, they still got to pay for it. Yes. And is it something that they really need? So you just need to be mindful of making sure that you have a plan, you have a budget that uh, reflects that plan, and you adhere to it yes. to, to the greatest extent possible. Yes, uh, 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 of course. So let's think about this plan you're talking about. And, and I, I love the term a strategic plan because it's not just something you put together. It's a strategic plan. So how does the financial component fit into a strategic plan? Yeah, so the, the, the way I look at it, a strategic plan is like a roadmap. So the roadmap is going to tell you how you're going to get from point A to point B. And you're going to follow the map in order to do that the best way you know how, or the best way it's telling you. You're not going to deviate, but you want to get from point A to point B. Does that mean that there might be some uh, detours along the way? Possibly, but the map is going to show you how you're going to get to your destination. That's like the strategic plan. The strategic plan is going to put, uh, take into consideration your mission, the vision for your business, all the goals and objectives that you that you have for that particular year or period, uh, and then all of the tasks and tactics that you're going to put in, in the, into uh, play to make sure that you're meeting those goals and objectives. So the financial component, I like to think of as like the gas gauge on your car, right? So you need to know that you have enough gas in the tank to get from point A to point B. So the strategic plan is your map. The budget is your gas gauge. you got to have enough gas in the tank to get to your destination. You have to have to have enough money in your business to fulfill the plans that you have in place. So it'll make it so much easier when you're going through the year to always look at that gas gauge. How are you doing according to uh, how much gas do you need to get to your destination? How much money do you have in your business in order to meet those goals and objectives? And using that analogy, if your plan or your trip is so big that you need to make multiple stops for gas, that might not be a bad thing. So in your strategic plan, it might mean that there are stages throughout there that you're infusing cash either through maybe a promotion, a sales promotion, or hiring people or these these ways to to get there. So I think that's Absolutely. a really neat analogy. Absolutely. They're, they're going to be times during the year that uh, you'll be spot on with the plan, but there will be times that you'll have to shift. And, you know, there might be a crisis situation like we're in now uh, with uh, the coronavirus that we have to make some uh, adjustments. And that's okay. That's okay to have to be in a situation where you can make adjustments because if you already have a plan and you already have a budget that meets that plan, it's a whole lot easier to make those adjustments. If you're going down the road without a map and you want to get to desti destination B from point A and you don't know how to get there, you're go working in the dark, right? Yeah. You're, you're, 
going without any direction. It's the same thing. Yep. It gives you a plan. Yeah. It gives it you that. You get to that destination quicker. Yep. It gives you that track, dream track to run on to make sure that you're, you know, right there on track. So throughout the plan, progressing through it, you need to make decisions one way or the other. Mm -hmm. What are some indicators that you're making good decisions for the financial health of your business? Great question. So every, every month, every week, every quarter, you are looking at some key metrics within your business to make sure that you are on track. And depending on how volatile the business is, if it's more volatile, you're going to be looking at those metrics weekly. If it's less volatile, you can look at them monthly. Uh, certainly no less than monthly because um, there are too many things that can happen during the course of a month that uh, you might need to adjust. But uh, you need to be able to look back at the, those metrics and say, okay, we're, we're meeting our goals, we're meeting our objectives, and now we can go to the next month and next period and, and know that we're on track or we've missed the goal and we need to adjust. So I, I worked with a client who uh, reviewed their financials weekly. There was a meeting that, that was held every week. All the leaders came together Everybody was responsible for, uh, every leader had responsibility for a few of the financial metrics that they showed on a dashboard. And if they met goal, then the next week they just went on with, uh, with the plan. If they were off, then they knew how to adjust. So it really depends on how volatile the business is and as to how often you need to review. But the only way you know how you're performing is to really have those metrics in place and compare on a periodic basis. Does yep. that make sense? Yes, because one frequency for one business might be very different than another. It all de depends on what the outcome and objective is. So Absolutely. what's right for your business, you need to know. And and thinking about adding uh, staff, that's a, another aspect with, you know, maybe making good decisions. Should we get a loan or not? How often should we review a plan? How do you know when to make adjustments to staff? Yeah, so that's that's a really tough one because you need to know how much labor you need in order to provide the service or to manufacture the product. And the only way to know that is to really keep a good eye on those metrics with regard to your personnel. So how many labor hours does it take to provide that service or to manufacture that product? What's the, what's the benchmark associated with that productivity? And track that over a period of time so you know if you're being efficient, if you're being productive. Uh, also, you have to be in, in really uh, in tune with your labor. You need to be able to just get with your teams and just have that human side and just talk and understand where they're coming from, how they're doing, how they're functioning, and you'll be able to tell whether they're stressed or not and why they're stressed, and then go back to the data and see if the data is consistent with the feedback that you get from your, your teams. But the decision has to be made based on both components. You're looking at the metrics associated with the personnel with, with regard to the resources you have available, and then you're also looking at how are they functioning as a team. How are they performing? How does how do they seem to be behaving under these particular circumstances? And you'll know you'll know if if it's time to hire, or and to, if you do, how many how many yep. people you need to hire? To what extent you need to increase your labor costs? So, what would you say to a business that? is making a decision to hire or not hire. And they look at this uh, division of their company and they want to expand it and grow it. And they are given the option, well, we need to hire a, an extra, let's say a salesperson. And we need to expand into these markets to increase our sales, increase our revenues. And the, the struggle is we don't have the money to hire that person but then it, that's balanced with, but if we hire that person and they increase our sales, that pays for themselves plus some. 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. So, you know, when I when I'm uh, faced with that kind of a dilemma, I really like to look at what is what's the plan associated with the business. Is that particular new uh, product or new service is that part of the plan, or is this something completely new that uh, is sort of a deviation from the plan? Because if you don't have that growth already built into your plan, that means you don't have that expense in your budget. Mm. So you know that you're going to have probably, very likely, a negative budget variance. So you're probably not going to be meeting the financial performance expectations that you set forth at the beginning of the year. So you really need to evaluate whether that's something that you can take on as a business if it wasn't already planned for. Mm -hmm. The best case scenario is you have that plan in place. The budget is part of the plan. So you know what new business you're going to take on, how much it's going to cost you to take on that new business. And within that cost, are you going to add, uh, add some folks to help deliver that service or manufacture that product? And it's already built into the plan. So you know how much it's going to cost you. You know what the return is going to be. So you're going to know how much revenue you're going to realize from taking on that new business. So it's not a surprise. When you have those deviations, that's when you get surprises. Now, I'm not saying that you'll never deviate from the plan. That's not my point. But you need to be, be, be prepared for if you take on a deviation, if you take on a new business that's not part of the plan, you're going to experience some potentially uh, financial setback. At least for the short term until Correct. then that uh, new employee starts producing and then it meets it and then hopefully exceeds it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, I'm not saying that you can never deviate, but you need to be prepared for that. So if you're going to take on a new business or take on a new product, sell a new service, and it's going to require uh, new staff to do that, remember the hire, the recruiting, hiring, training, it's it's depending on the type of position, can be as short as maybe a week to as long as several months, mm -hmm. excuse me, several months in order to find the right fit for those types of positions. Um, you know, we've been talking about plans and budgets. Um, I know this sounds like a basic question, but why does a business even need a budget? Well, that's a great question. And, I, and I've actually worked uh, with clients in the past that uh, have resisted uh, having a budget. And, uh, you know, my response to that is everybody needs a budget. Every business needs a budget. Every uh, person needs to know what their personal income is, how, what their personal expenses are. So you, you can plan accordingly. Well, business is the same. You need to have some kind of idea of how much it's going to cost you to operate that business. And if you don't know, you're working in the dark. And even if there's volatility associated with that business, you need to somehow develop a plan that's going to tell you where you could be at the end of that fiscal period. And what I mean by that is even though there's going to be some volatility, if you don't have a budget in place and a budget that coincides with the plan, it's going to be difficult for you to to get to that end result, the end result that you're looking for, that typically is to exceed your expectations in financial performance. And more immediate than that, if you do have to take on debt, what's a bank going to be asking you for? Bank's going to be asking you for a business plan. What's going to be in the business plan? Well, it's going to have some type of a budget. So you're going to have to provide the bank with an idea of what your revenues are going to be, what your expenses are, and that's the only way that you're going to really have a good productive conversation with your lenders as to taking on additional debt if you need to. But again, a budget is like the gas gauge on the car, right? You can't operate a car. You can't drive a car and, you know, indefinitely you have to have gas in the tank. You have to know how much gas you have so you know how far you can go. 
And what sense. about if um, I know that anything changes. So can the budget change? And if so, how often is acceptable without the business being viewed as being all over the place? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've always been of the thought process that, uh, you know, you have you have your budget set for the year. It's carved in stone. You're done and you're going to just uh, evaluate as you go forward. But, you know, through the course of my 30 plus years of experience in the corporate world, I've learned that that is not not the best uh, approach. So, you know, having a budget carved in stone is fine. However, you do you do need to be prepared for the fact that there's going to be uh, potential changes occurring to your business uh, that you need to be able to flex. And an operating budget, uh, if you flex your operating budget, and what I mean by that is you're going to adjust the revenue side of the equation up or down. You're going to ex- uh, adjust the expense side up or down. Uh, to meet whatever changes are impacting your business. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to do that on a regular basis, but if you come across or are impacted by a crisis like what we're experiencing now, I think it would be foolish for you not to take a look at your budget and adjust because that's the only way you're going to be able to to really plan for the, you know, the rest of the year. You got to be able to adjust. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I know a budget kind of is a little backward facing and forward looking because you have to see what's been happening and then also project. So how detailed should this budget be? Can you use some rough estimates or should it be very, very precise and, uh, um, you know, kind of like rigid? Yeah. So, you know, I've always, I'm a very detailed person. So I've always been in the thought process that the more detail you have, the better, accuracy you're going to experience going forward. Um, But the key is you got to have a budget. So whether you're uh, the best data you have is just by estimating uh, based on history, then use it. If you have the opportunity to get more detailed data to make better uh, projections, then you'll have a more accurate budget. But the key is to do that, uh, do that review, look at the big picture of your business. How did you perform? Why did you have that particular financial outcome? What are some of the uh, impacts of that financial income or the bottom line? You know, what were your revenues? What were your expenses? Uh, Answer the question why, and then you can be able to project forward. So you got to do your review. You got to examine the detail. And then you'll be able to better plan for the future. And I've always been in the thought process, the more detail you have, the more accurate your projections will be. But the key is you got to have yeah. some type of a budget going forward. Yeah. And we've talked about tracking, the importance of tracking, but are there any specifics you would recommend in tracking budget and, and how the business is performing, maybe specific tools or, or reports or charts? Yeah. So, uh, when I was uh, speaking about this client earlier that uh, they, the leaders got together every week, they looked at a series of metrics within the business that told them how they were operating. And depending on the business, there are different metrics that I think uh, would work. Um, for example, if you are in retail, uh, they look at daily sales. Uh, that's that's critical. They need to know how they're doing on a daily basis with regard to their selling their products. Uh, Different businesses function differently. If you're in consulting like me, you look at uh, the number of hours that you've provided. Uh, The key is you have to look at uh, metrics within your business that show or tell you how you're performing. So financially, obviously, you're going to be looking at gross margin. You're going to be looking at operating income. You're going to be looking at uh, increase, decrease to cash balance. Uh, You're going to be looking at your liquidity position. There are different metrics in the balance sheet that you're going to look at on a periodic basis to see, are you able to cover your current debt? Uh, What is your current debt? Uh, You're going to get that from the balance sheet. So there are different metrics that, based on the business, that need to be looked at at different times of the year. Some as often as weekly, some monthly. 
um, but certainly no less than monthly. You mentioned daily. It makes me wonder, is daily too often to review metrics or does it depend on the business? It really depends on the business. So uh, when I was speaking about the daily, I was talking about retail. Well, retail looks at the daily sales so they know how to adjust for uh, you know, providing discounts or putting things on sale so they can move merchandise. So you know, in, in some businesses, daily is appropriate. In others, daily would be you know, way overboard. So it really depends on the business. As always, it always depends on the business, right? And that really sounds like a, a cop-out, but that really is the case. No. You have to know your business, know where you're different in the industry, know where you're different than the competition even, and, and adjust accordingly. Well, that's right. And, and you, know, you want to use your time uh, the most productively you can, right? So if you spend all your time just looking at metrics when you don't need to, then you're wasting time, you're wasting the company uh, money because you're not being productive and adding value to the company. Exactly. Hey, so talking about a budget, how should a business develop a meaningful budget? And and what I mean by that is maybe um, here's this template we found. We're just going to fill in the blanks with numbers and mindlessly fill it out so we have that box checked for we have a budget. (laughs) Yeah, so never never go by the mindless uh, approach. <laughs> uh, you want to be able to put some things in place that are meaningful, and the way you do that is uh, you look at history. So if, if you're an individual, for example, uh, and I'll just use my three kids. I put budgets together for my three kids. They're older, um, but they, they all need to have some kind of an idea of, uh, what uh, income they need to to make during the course of the year in order to um, provide for those expenses that they want to uh, incur during the course of the year, whether it's uh, something as simple as how much they're going to spend on you know, going to the movies or whatever. So I'm, I'm really simplifying here, but uh, the point is you need to look at some pattern in history in order to to then project for the future. Now, I've also been in healthcare. Now, that's the exact opposite uh, side from what I was just speaking of, and it, it was a very simple budget for an individual. Healthcare, depending on the complexity of the organization, those budgets can take uh, several months to, to complete because you've got multiple departments, you've got multiple staff, you've got uh, vendors to, to take into, into consideration, but you're looking at the patterns from your historical data in order to develop those line items for your future budget, the budget that you're going to use for the next year. And the best way to do that, again, is uh, look at your line items uh, based on history, and then you can either use the financial outcomes from previous uh, uh, fiscal periods or you can do what's called zero-based, and you just start from scratch. You take those line items, and you look at each line item individually, and you determine how much you need to apply to each line item, it's, you know, starting from zero. So the best way to do it, look at history, uh, what happened in the past, and then use that to go forward. And, you know, you mentioned your kids. Um, so I think a lot of organizations might think, you know, here's my strategic plan and my budget for the organization. And then they fail to do the same thing on their personal and family life. So isn't it, um, it we've talked about this previously, but isn't it very important to integrate the same principles, maybe on a smaller scale for your personal life um, as well as your organization? Absolutely. That's the only way you'll know uh, how your you know, performing as an individual or as a family. And what I mean by that, I don't mean uh, performing in any other way than are you able to meet your expenses? That's what, that's what I'm uh, alluding to here. You need to be able to have enough income to cover your expenses and then to put some in savings. And the only way that you can plan for that is to have some kind of a personal budget Otherwise, again, you're working in the dark. 
and maybe even the making the correlation to the strategic plan maybe the strategic plan personally is planning you know for years into retirement to know whether you've got enough gas in the tank or money or cash flow to meet meet the bills number one then Mm -hmm. take care of your you know extra things you want to do uh, um you know charity work things like that as well Mm -hmm. as then okay am i going to meet the needs of my uh, retirement whatever, whatever however long that is that's right yeah you need to know um, far into this as reasonable as possible. I mean, taking into consideration, there's always going to be events taking place that could alter your plan. For example, if you change jobs or uh, you move, the cost of living might be different and you know, wherever you're relocating to. So those are going to be variables you need to take into consideration. But by and large, you have to have sort of a big picture idea, your plan, your own strategic plan, where you want to be at what point in your life so you can plan you know the details and the details being how much income do you need to get there and what expenses can you afford within your income that meet uh where the bottom line of what's going to get you there makes sense it, it totally does you know it makes me think too about um when you should develop a budget. And I know it sounds obvious, you know, at the beginning, but what does the beginning look like for specific organizations? Yeah. So every organization has a fiscal year. So, uh, you know, some organizations, if they're very complicated, and again, I uh, was speaking to healthcare uh, previously and, you know, healthcare can be very complicated. Uh, We've seen uh, today's what's going on with our crisis today, how, uh, all of our healthcare uh, organizations and workers have really stepped up and are doing an unbelievable job uh, you know, facing the crisis that we have going on right now. But in order to make sure that you have all of the resources in place, they need to plan for it. And some of those organizations are, are huge with uh, you know, thousands of employees and uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenues and expenses. And in order to capture all of that, it takes a long time to to get through all of the all the details within each department. So uh, it's not unusual for a budget to to take uh, three, four months to to really get all of the detail and get it in place and approved and, and ready to go for the next year. Now the you know much easier, simpler than that is as a small business where maybe it's just a sole proprietor or a small partnership, they might be able to do a budget in you know a couple of weeks and, and have it ready to go for the next fiscal year. And the fiscal year depends on, on the business. Most go from based on the calendar year of January to December. Uh, some are from July to June. But whatever the case is, you want to be able to plan ahead. So, for example, if I'm a sole proprietor, and my fiscal year is January to December, I'm looking uh, at all of my historical data through November. So I'm ready to put the budget together in December and have it in place January 1. Make sense? Uh, It totally does. You know, we've been talking about a strategic plan and a budget. What's the real difference between the two? The difference between a strategic plan and a budget? Yes, because I, okay. it, it seems to me like it would be, you know, like the business plan is the 30,000 foot view, but within the business plan is the marketing plan. And that would be an element of, so is the yeah. budget an element of the strategic plan? Yeah, yeah, it sure is. So the best way to describe it is when you're putting a plan together for, well, let's take a, a new business. Uh, we're putting a plan together for a new business. And in that plan, we have to include the different components that we talked about earlier, right? We have to look at the financials. We have to look at the marketing. We have to look at the resources. We have to look at the systems that we're going to use, the technology. That's all going to be part of the plan. But all of those components, like I said earlier, like 99% of the decisions that are made are going to have some kind of a financial impact. So a big part of that plan is the budget, the financial projections. What are you projecting that's going to occur within that that new business? So when you go out and 
and sell that plan, if you will, to a lender or a potential investor, what are one of the what's one of the first things they're going to look at? They're going to look at okay, what's this new business, and what's it going to cost, and what's the return? Well, what's it's going to cost? That's going to be the capital budget, right? That's going to tell you what the investment is going to be in order to make that business uh, go. The return is what's going to be the profitability associated with that business. So the budget is part of the part of the big picture. It's one of the pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. But I don't want to I want don't want to demean the other pieces because they're very important too. You can't yeah. make a business work without people. You got to have a marketing plan. I mean, nobody knows that better than you, right? Yeah, they're all <laughs> critical as standalone and then they're even more powerful when they're working together in synergy. Correct. You know, we've been talking about how the budget can even flex and change throughout the year based on circumstances. What about a strategic plan, the overall strategic plan? When and how often could that strategic plan change or be developed? Well, strategic plans, again, based on the complexity of the organization, can be a one-year plan, five-year plan. There are municipalities that have 10-year and 20-year plans, but every plan can be adjusted, and it's going to take some type of uh, uh, environmental shift or something that's going to significantly impact the business in order to alter the plan during the course of a year. So plans can adjust. The budgets within the plan can adjust. Uh, you don't want to do that too often because you know the plan is is the map, right? It's going to tell it's telling you how to get from point A to point B, and the budget is going to tell you what can you can afford in order to get to point B, how much gas you need in the tank in order to get there. Yeah. So there's going to be adjustments, and you can do that periodically, but it needs to be something of significance occurring within the business or impacting the business to create that need for an adjustment because that the plan the strategic plan is like the the financial foundation underpinnings of the business that you don't need to feel like we should be tweaking that too often no no the strategic plan is something that uh, you've set for the year or for five years Uh, actually i know i have a strategic plan for the year i have a five-year plan Uh, i would encourage everybody and businesses to at least have at very minimal, a one-year plan, better to have a five-year plan, again, knowing that that's going to be tweaked along the way. Um, but you need to know what it's going to take to fulfill that plan. And the plan's got to, got to meet your mission and your vision for your business. It all works together. You, know, you have your mission, you have your vision for the business, you have your goals and objectives. Uh, how are you going to meet those goals and, goals and objectives? And how much is it going to cost you? Yeah, you know, as as the business moves through the the year or the period, whether it's a three year plan or five, but as they move through the strategic plan, what are the financial outcomes that are the most important to keep the finger on the pulse of? Because there's some that I think would be fluctuating more, but what about the overall financial outcomes that are most important to look at? Great question. So, when I put a business plan together uh, for a client. I, I know that depending on who's going to be reading the plan, uh, they're going to be looking at different uh, outcome metrics. So if it's uh, the owner, they're going to want to make sure that this particular business is profitable and that they can pay for their bills. So they're going to be looking at cash flow and they're going to be looking at operating income. Cash flow is going to tell them what their liquidity position is and can they pay for their current debt associated with the business. Their operating income is going to tell them how their business is performing. Now, again, that's different than net income because there could be some non-operating items thrown into net income, but you got to look at the operating income. You also have to look at your break-even. Your break-even tells you, are you priced accordingly based on the variable costs associated with manufacturing or delivering your product? So break-even is as simple as you know, taking the variable cost from your price and then covering all of your fixed costs. So you need to know what's your break-even, what's your operating income, what's your cash flow. Now, if I'm an investor or if I'm pro- providing the business plan to an investor, they want to know 
what is their return on investment? So how much is it going to cost me to get into this business? And what am I going to get out of it? And the part that you need to know in order to determine what am I going to get out of it is the profitability associated with that business. So it depends on your audience, but the keys are cash, operating income, break even, net profit. And then once that is reviewed, how do you check the box and, and say our business is financially successful? Well, if you meet the expectations that you've put in place, or for example, a business plan was accepted, we've implemented the business, now it's uh, going forward. Uh, every month we're looking at have we met those financial and overall operating metrics and goals. Uh, then we look at it by year. and. Again, we never, the worst case is uh, we say goals met, we're all done. That's never the case. Going back to the rear approach, we review, we examine the details, we adjust as needed, we uh, realize the fruits of our labor and revise as we need to, but then we're ready to start the cycle again. Yeah. It's always ongoing. We never, never get complacent. We always review, examine, adjust, and realize. So with that thought in mind, when you're reviewing and examining, is there ever a point or when comes the point when you might need to actually make a change to the overall business model, you know, like pivoting the business? Are there any Um, maybe trigger points that would come up to go, if this, then that? Yeah. Um, And and as a matter of fact, I was just speaking with a business owner yesterday and they had a, a real concern that uh, their customer base is not going to be um, paying like they like they were. So they're afraid that their bad debt is going to increase. So you know, his question was, what do I do? I don't, I don't know what to do. What's going to happen? So we talked through it uh, a little bit and you know, we planned out the fact that Okay, customers are not going to pay like they were. So what's going to happen? Your receivables are going to increase. Your bad debt is going to increase. Your day is receivable. The amount of time it takes for customers to pay, that's going to increase. And how can we plan for that? So we know we're projecting the outcome. Now we're going to try to adjust. And we're going to adjust our business model. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how do customers pay? How they've paid historically is different than how they're going to pay going forward. So, for example, if they paid in a lump sum at the end of some type of a term or engagement, now they're going to pay periodically. We're going to develop payment plans that work better for the customer and enhance cash flow for the business. We're going to look at different customer membership opportunities. So, having a customer join, if you will, that particular business might be more financially advantageous to the customer because they're getting uh, what they would see as better service, more timely service. But from the business, they're getting a stable, consistent cash flow. So we're looking at different ways to really provide the service and uh, that the customers are looking for. And at the same time, make it easier for the customer to pay for that service and for the business to get a better idea of of their cash flow and have it be more consistent and stable. And that's a result of constantly reviewing and evaluating and assessing. And and, because if you only did this once a year, you tend to just blow right by it and you wouldn't pick up on things like this, these potential opportunities or small pivot points. Yeah, I mean, the great, the, the great outcome of this particular situation was that the client was proactive. You know, he, he was he called me up and said, Jeff, I've got a problem here. Uh, you know, I know my customers aren't going to be paying like they were. You know, let's figure out what we need to do. But if he hadn't done that, you know, he might wait until, I'm sure there are businesses that are going to be more reactive. And, you know, next January, they're going to figure out that uh, it was too late. They needed to adjust uh, six, seven months prior. 
So proactive is definitely the way to go, especially in a crisis situation. For sure. Yeah. Don't run from the problem, face the problem. And, and, you know, with that thought in mind, like financials and all of these things we're talking about, why is it that some people kind of get it and understand it and other people don't? And depending on the size of the business, maybe your position is uh, as the um, owner, maybe you need to uh, uh, bone up on that, or maybe you need to bring someone in that can handle it. But what are you finding with some people that just kind of don't, you know, have this click for them? Yeah, so uh, I'm certified in the DISC behavioral assessment, and and I love that because it, it's it's not the end all be all, but it definitely helps in understanding what a person's strengths are and opportunities. And there are folks that are extremely detailed; they like the structure. Uh, they just go by you know step one, step two, the flow chart. There are other folks that just like the big picture, don't want to look at reports. So people that are more uh, gifted in areas of big picture, visionary, they don't necessarily look at the details of a financial statement. So it's it's completely reasonable. And, and any leader should expect that teams will have different strengths and opportunities, and every person is going to have a different strength and opportunity. Now, that said, within an organization, a leader needs to be transparent, and they need to be able to convey and communicate all of the plans and and budgets to the greatest extent possible with their teams, with, with the organization. So everybody knows what direction the company is going and how they're going to get there. And there are people that are going to understand and they're going to right away. And there are going to be other people that might take a little longer because that's not necessarily their strength. And when that happens, it's really communicating in a very general way. It's communicating in terms that that person is going to understand. You'd never want to talk over somebody and, you know, convey information in such a way that gets them confused and frustrated and fearful. You want to respect the fact that everybody has different strengths, everybody has different opportunities, and convey that critical information in a way that people are going to understand. Again, it's completely reasonable to expect that some people will understand the financials and some people will not. And you just need to communicate based on their strengths and opportunities. And when you're trying to communicate maybe a tougher financial situation to uh, maybe your team or the overall company, is there a time that you can communicate too much detail? Maybe you need to hold a little bit back? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Too much detail, uh, you'll be able to, you'll see if uh, people are responding and they're engaged in the conversation or they're not. So if you... And I said earlier, I'm a very detailed person. So I I always err on the side of providing too much detail. And so I, I, I know that about me. So I know that I need to keep that in check. So I start by providing the most critical, high level information and kind of get an idea of how the audience is responding to that. And if it's in, you know, a group setting, I want to make sure that it's it's communicated in a way that everybody can understand it, and that might be, you know, very general terms. Even if it's if it's tough information, I'm communicating that in a way that is more a uh, big picture, more general, and letting them know how this particular outcome is going to impact the business in more of a general way. And then and they feel like they're part of it at that point too. They might they even come up it. with an idea of a solution. They are part of it. Absolutely. Yep. And they're, you know, the worst case is that, you know, leadership doesn't include the teams in that critical information, that that information is not disseminated at all. Uh, that information absolutely needs to be shared. And the teams are important to the company. Every person is important to the company and they need to be they need to feel valued. And the only way to do that is to include them, get them engaged in the conversation. 
Yeah, hundred um, percent. And you never know, you might get some, you know, off the wall uh, idea that actually is the start of a solution. So bringing the yeah. team in is a really big piece of it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Hey, so in, in times of mounting financial challenges, because there's ebbs and flows in business, whether it's ex- external in the uh, um, economy or whether it's mm-hmm. internal in the organization or, or the competitive landscape, when there's a mounting financial challenge, where does an organization start in addressing it? Well, they need to know uh, what's going on in, with whether it's external or inter- internal. The only way they can do that is is by going through the the review and examination steps. And once they kind of get their current state uh, under understood that they know where they're at now, then they can do their uh, deeper analysis and adjustments in order to plan for the future. So, you know, where they start, they have to look at all of those metrics that we were talking about earlier see how they compare to where they should be, and then adjust accordingly. So it goes back to, you know, the plan. Do they have a plan for the year? If they do, what are the components of that plan? Hopefully they have a a budget that's within the plan. And how are they performing based on those budget and those metrics that they've established? So every month, at least every month, as they're comparing actual outcomes to the plan and the budget, they'll be able to adjust and know how things should end up going forward for the rest of the year. Um, It really helps to eliminate or at least alleviate some of those surprises that can occur. You know, whether they made it through a financial challenge or at the end of the year or the uh, uh, period of time, three years, um, reviewing the strategic plan, what happens when they achieve the results they were looking for? Do they high five and put it on coast and, and enjoy the fruit of their labor or what do they do from there? Yeah. So uh, I never would uh, advocate just sitting back and uh, enjoying the successes. Now that said, uh, you need to celebrate every single success that occurs. Uh during the course of a year, whether it's a day, week, month, quarter, uh, as goals are achieved, uh, as people uh, participate and are engaged in the successes of the business, you need to celebrate all of that. So when the end of the year comes and all of the uh, goals and objectives have been, uh, all of the expectations have been exceeded, absolutely celebrate all of that. But The next step is getting ready for the next year, getting ready for the next fiscal period. Never be complacent. And it does not need to be um, dramatic increases up. The next step doesn't need to be a 40% increase in overall output. It it could be incremental knowing that then it has a compound effect. It's all based on the outcome of the previous uh, period. So there let's take, for example, a company, Finish spot on the, the plan, met the plan based on uh, the budget. Everything was met uh, according to everything that was established a year before. So what do they do the next year? Same thing. Well, they have to really do their due diligence to determine is the next year going to be the same? Is the environment going to be the same? Is the market going to be the same? Uh, Are there going to be other external factors that need to be considered in developing the plan for the next year? So uh, you need to really look at all the different components. What happened this year to to help them achieve their budget? Was it a budget that was too easy? Um, Was it a budget that was spot on and that we just need to increase by inflationary terms because the market's going to be consistent? But Whatever the case is, you need to look at the whys. Why did they meet the budget spot on or why didn't they? And then what are the factors that we need to consider in the business environment, the external environment uh, for the next year to develop the plan and the budget? You know, it made me think of a question when we're setting strategic objectives and goals. What do you think about goals and objectives that are stretch? 
because it makes me wonder, could it be set too much of a stretch that frustrates the team knowing they can never achieve it? But then the the leadership could go, we want to set this stretch so that it just expands their thinking. And then if they get 75% of it, it's really a, a win in our eyes. But the the field might look at it as a loss because they didn't meet it. Should there be a balance there yeah. or what could that look like? Yeah, You know, I've always been sort of, uh, I haven't really warmed up to stretch goals. Um, because in my thinking, you have a goal. and you either meet the goal or you don't meet the goal. Now, if you're going to have another goal, that's fine, but let's just call it the goal. And you could have milestones in, you know, in getting to that goal, meeting that goal. But when you have a goal and then you have a stretch goal, what's really the goal? Goal is the stretch yeah. goal. Yeah. The other it, goal is the milestone. And and there has to be a level of belief. So if it's if it's personally or or in the organization, if the organization did a million dollars in sales last year and now they set the stretch goal for four million and and the previous year they went from eight hundred to a million, the organization is not gonna believe it could be done. It's it, so that stretch then has a negative of impact. Yeah, and and I would ask the question, how was that goal developed? Who is who participated in the discussion? in determining what that goal should be. How did they get that uh, determination? Was everybody included? Was everybody engaged? Is everybody on board? Because there could be a situation where they're planning for, you know, a 200, 300% increase, which would be great. And everybody was involved in making that decision. When I'm being everybody, that means leadership and all the teams that are going to help meet that goal. And if everybody's on board and everybody agrees, then it's reasonable. Exactly. But yeah. if leadership says, yeah, we're going to increase sales by 300% next year without any engagement from the teams, with other, from other leadership within the organization, how, how far is that going to get? Yeah, you're exactly right. It just frustrates, just frustrates yeah. the team. <laughs> Hey, can you think of a case study example of um, maybe bringing all of this together into applying the rear approach to a, a company and, and how you work with them to, to really um, take them through each one of these steps and maybe some of the outcomes? Sure. So uh, I've been in the uh, corporate world for over 30 years, worked with different kinds of, uh, within different industries, different companies. Um, I worked mostly with with healthcare uh, clients and within the healthcare setting. And one of my favorite situations that I look back on is uh, is a particular business that we started within a healthcare organization, and we developed the business plan. So we were called in. They wanted to start this new business. Didn't know anything about it and wanted to see if this is something that we could uh, tell them it was whether it would be a good idea or not. So we developed a plan. The plan included a five-year financial projection, the comprehensive marketing plan and sales goals. Uh, we looked at all of the resources that were going to be needed in order to make this plan work, all of the operations and systems and technology uh, and so we put this comprehensive plan in place and through the course of conversation with the owner, uh, determined that there are going to be some tweaks needed to the plan. They didn't, uh, weren't fully on board with everything that we had in the plan, which is, is reasonable to assume. Uh, they're the owner. We want to make sure that they're going to be uh, able to fulfill all of the components of the plan. But then we implemented it. And so after it was accepted, approved, we implemented, and th- that's where the fun really begins. So you see a business that you put together a plan for come to life. So hiring all the people, developing all the services, putting all the policies and procedures in place for that uh, particular business, and then seeing how it's going to perform. And knowing that how we put the plan together and see it come to life and how all of the projections either were met or not, 
that's where that's where it really got exciting. And this particular example, fortunately, uh, we exceeded expectations with regard to some of the financial goals, but we also needed to make some tweaks along the way. And what I mean by that is there were some uh, services within that business that were not going to work. So we still had the overarching financial goals. Uh, We still wanted to meet all the expectations of the plan, but we had to do some tweaks to the detail. And we were able to do that. And, you know, now it's been several years later and the business is still flourishing. And it's just a great, uh, great success story. That was a great experience to, to, to go through. And it's great to look back on now. Yeah, it really sounds neat. It's like in the immortal words of Hannibal from the A-Team, I love it when a plan comes together. (laughs) Yeah, but you know, the key is you can't be complacent, right? I mean, we could have just said, all right, plan in place, we're done. But that's not how it it's not, that's not how it's going to work. Yep. You've got to continually review, examine, adjust where you need to, and then realize the fruits of your labor. And you mentioned you you discovered a service that just was not going to work, and then you had to make an adjustment. How did you notice, what was without getting into detail, but how did you know that a specific service wasn't working? Was it um, something that you were seeing results not panning out the way you wanted? Right. So earlier I was speaking to uh, measuring uh, outcomes on a daily, weekly, quarterly basis. So in this particular service, we were looking at uh, metrics daily. And then we were looking at those same metrics over the course of a week and then a month. And within uh, really a couple of months, we knew um, that it was not going to work. And, And if we had not measured, if we had not really put the Uh, components in place to track how we were performing, we would have never come to that realization. But we did, fortunately, and uh, we had some great people in place that could could, uh, really pivot when we needed to. And uh, based on that continual review and examination, we were able to make those changes. And if you reviewed uh, at the end of the year only, it might have been way too late. It would have been too late. It, It would have been too late. And the business would not have been as successful. And, uh, you know, but again, it goes back to the type of of service or type of business. So uh, this particular service warranted looking at the metrics on a daily basis. Hey, well, let's shift uh, gears and talk about Jeff. What inspired you to become a business consultant? You know, it was these types of experiences. It was, it was seeing, um, putting a plan in place and then seeing it come to life and making sure that the client is um, pleased with the outcome, that that I was able to add value to the organization. And, you know, other situations where I've seen opportunities and perhaps for whatever reason, uh, leadership didn't uh, completely agree with some of those uh, recommendations that were made. And I felt so passionate about um, what I was trying to accomplish. And I felt the only way I could really make this happen and help as many people as I can is to strike out on my own and develop my own consulting. So that that's what I've done. And I really feel strongly that, uh, you know, when it comes to business, and comes to helping a business meet those expectations and thrive, it starts with understanding yourself, your strengths, your opportunities, understanding the business, planning accordingly, knowing how to plan, knowing how much it's going to cost, putting all of that together to create some success. And the best outcome is seeing a business succeed because of maybe one or two recommendations that I, that I've been able to provide Mm -hmm. and has worked from that outside perspective, looking in that maybe they never would have seen um, otherwise. Yeah. You know, for, for me, uh, the tagline to our business is serve others, seek wisdom and achieve excellence. It's all about serving 
the greater good. It's about helping people achieve what they're looking to achieve. And we always have to be learning. You know, the seek wisdom part is we always have to be receptive to what's going on in the world. We always have to be receptive to the fact that we need to always learn, always learn new ways, better ways to do things. That's the only way we can be the very best we can be for the client. And that's the only way that I think that we can really help them to achieve excellence. You know, you mentioned uh, seeking wisdom. Did you have any mentors coming up in your business career? And uh, what kind of uh, advice that you did you learn from them that you find yourself still using even today? Oh, yeah. I have mentors going back to, gosh, when I was in college to, you know, today, you know, the people that look up to. And I think we all need to have uh, mentors that help us to remain focused and to help us achieve what we're, what we're looking to achieve. And, you know, it's always good to surround yourself with people that are, um, you know, I like to think uh, people that are smarter and know a whole lot that I can uh, glean something from. So when I was in college, there was, uh, there was a professor that I, I really liked, was very passionate about, uh, you know, I was studied finance and economics. He was an economics professor, and he just got so passionate about uh, <laughs> microeconomics. And, you know, you, you really uh, have to like the subject in order to remain yes, engaged. But, 100%. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I happen to really like economics. So, uh, but he, he said, you know, there are always going to be times that you're not going to necessarily enjoy or you're not going to want to be engaged, but those are the times that are the most critical. You know, don't mm, yeah. don't become one of those people that are just going to you know excel when times are good. Yep, uh, it's going to be when times are tough that are that are going to be really the times that you're going to grow. Yeah, we, sh- we shouldn't hope for and pray that we don't have tough times. We should hope for and yeah. pray that we become stronger through them. Right. You know, and then years later, I was working with uh, with a guy who uh, was, a, it was he was an exceptional leader. And, you know, I was learning and he said, you know, good leaders aren't made when times are good. Good leaders are made when times are bad. And, wow. you know, I, I thought, oh, I'm never, that was profound. And I thought, I'm, I'm not going to forget that. And yep. if you listen to some of the, you know, gurus today, like John Maxwell, I, I just love John Maxwell and what he stands for and what yep. he, what he uh, says. And he'll say the same thing, you know. We have, yep, your as, character as, is displayed through when the heat comes up, kind of like the example of the dross and the silver. You know, it, the, the, all the bad elements don't get out of the the silver until the heat is turned up just to a crazy high level, and mm-hmm. then you can pull it off. And then now you've got just a, a more pure um, element. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. So, Jeff, um, let's think about um, uh, this point. What would you say the most important question that organizations have to understand when looking to improve their bottom line? And then with the same thought in mind, when evaluating a business consultant like yourself to come in and guide them, because if an organization feels like we might need help, what is the most important thing they need to to know about improving their bottom line? And then they can get connected up with some consultants that might not be the right fit. What should they be watching for? Yeah, so I think when it comes to uh, really evaluating the business, they need to do that on, and we've talked about this, they have to do that on a regular basis. And I think it's always good to have some third-party evaluation. So it's like internally you don't always see what's going on until somebody else brings it to your attention. And then it's like, oh, wow, okay, I didn't realize that. But you know, it all starts with that comprehensive review and, you know, having somebody else, even if things are going great it, and internally they think things are going great. And then you bring in somebody from the outside, a consultant, and they confirm, yeah, things are going great. Then it just is, it, it validates everything that's, that's going on. 
So my point is, it's good to be proactive in good times, as opposed to reactive during the challenging times. And even when you don't maybe see the need to bring somebody in, um, it's always good to have somebody. And then when there is a need, then you have somebody already ready to go and they, they have a good understanding of the organization and they can do that review and detailed examination. They, they know where to look. You know, they know what the, what the liquidity position is, for example, of the company, or they know what the operating margin is. They know if their uh, break even is, you know, is going in the right direction. So some of those details I think are important to keep in mind always it's good to get somebody else from the outside to, to confirm and validate what's going on. And then when you're reviewing or, or doing your due diligence as an organization as to who you should bring in, obviously you need to have somebody that has competency. So they need to you know, be well-skilled in that area, and that area being uh, business operations, financial management. They need to be able to understand uh, the historical aspects of, of how the financial situation came to, to be. They know, need to know how to project out. And they need to, in addition to the competency, be able to develop that relationship with leadership and the organization and the teams. So you want to be able to have somebody that is, is uh, willing to work with and, uh, and be a part of the team. And sometimes you only determine that after you kind of get to know somebody a little bit. Um, but that's all part of the due diligence. You need to get somebody that is not just competent, but is uh, also interested in engaging uh, with the organization, the leadership, and the teams. Does that make sense? It totally does. And, and I would just even ask this uh, follow-up point. Is there a specific maybe a red flag or something when an organization is evaluating a business consultant that if this consultant says this or doesn't say this or approaches it this way, that might be a check to watch out or dig deeper um, because Mm -hmm. anybody can say they can come in and revolutionize this and transform that. But what would be something that an organization could watch out for just to get a little bit more depth? Yeah. So being on the other side of the fence for so many years and, I've had that opportunity to to uh, evaluate consultants coming in, and I was always uh, really intrigued when the consultant said that they knew the answers. So we were, we were um, you know having an introductory meeting or conversation, and they were conveying to the to me and the rest of leadership that they they knew the they knew what the problem was and they could solve it. And I always thought, well, how, how do you know, you know, how how do you really know that? I mean, you just met us, right? I mean, you don't know the business, you don't know leadership, you don't know what we're all about. You don't know what the organization is trying to accomplish. How how in the world do you know what is going to work? So what I'm, what I mean by that is make, make sure that, you have somebody that's coming in that is willing to learn, learn the company, learn the culture, uh, learn the plan, and work with it. They have to be competent, of course, and they have to be able to uh, provide some of that uh, challenging information, um, meaning that they might have to have some tough discussions about recommendations that uh, will challenge the company. But they have to be engaged. They can't come in and just, you know, like a free cookie, train. And, or cookie and, cutter, one size fits all. Here's what we need to do. Yeah. Let's go. And yeah, then there's like steam. And I know all the answers. That's just not, yeah. that's just not going to work. Well, Jeff, uh, how can someone find out more about PEM Consulting and potentially see if uh, you might be a right fit for helping their organization? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, website is PEMConsultingGroup.org, P E M. P as in Peyton, E as in Emma, and M as in Mary, uh, my three kids, Hey, consultinggroup.org. And there you can find out a little bit more about me and the company and what we're trying to accomplish, our, our core values, and uh, learn as to whether something that we're providing can fit with the business. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn and post regularly and uh, Facebook. Excellent. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful learning from you.
Yeah, well, it's been great to talk with you and uh, really appreciate the opportunity, Mike. Thanks. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.